The woodland period is best known for the burial mounds. But these burial mounds are not the only earthworks these peoples produced. They also made berms and ditches that created enclosures around these burial mounds. As you can see in the foreground of this image, there is a berm built on the backside of a ditch excavated in front of it. The material excavated out of the ditch piled up to create this berm of soil, a low wall that is segregating the enclosed area that contains the burial mounds from the area outside of it. We'll see how some of these enclosures were quite large, containing tens if not more than a hundred acres, and containing not just one, but many burial mounds. These burial mounds seem to have resulted from sequential enterals and cumulative use. It wasn't just a single person buried with a pile of dirt over them, and then another one with one more person buried. Many people are buried in each one. People continue to be added after it was first constructed, and they seem to have been used over many generations. They include both inhumations, burials in the flesh, and cremations, the burned remains of humans. Some secondary burials are of defleshed and bundle bones, so rather than having been laid in while still before the flesh decayed away, they had been exposed, the flesh decayed or is otherwise removed, and then the bones are bundled together and placed within the burial mound. There's elaborate staging of both bodies and associated off artifacts as offerings. Some mounds were built over earlier structures that may have been used as specialized features. Some may have been specialized mortuary facilities to prepare, store, and venerate human remains, as these seem to have been cultures that had a lengthy period of interaction with the dead prior to the entombment within a mound. These are called charnel houses by anthropologists, places where humans continued, living humans continued to interact with the remains of their dead ancestors. They also could have served as meeting houses for the whole community, where the dispersed homesteads from across the landscape were brought together for ritual and political activities. And there's also evidence that some were used as specialized workshops to manufacture ritual paraphernalia that were used in the mortuary rites associated with the mounds. And they were manufactured from special, exotic, imported materials like copper, mica, and obsidian. Many mounds are within sacred enclosures formed by earthen berms, low walls, piled up dirt, that it, and the ditches from which that soil had been excavated. Some of these sacred enclosures were formerly connected with roads that were partially defined along their length by long parallel berms, and it's believed that there was formerly a roadway that connected a whole series of sacred enclosures about 150 miles long from about Columbus, Ohio, down to the Ohio River. This cross-section of an early woodland mound shows an initial primary burial within a pit that was then covered with a mound. Later burials were placed in this initial mound, and then the mound was expanded in order to accommodate the continued interral of other burials. Now this indicates that these mounds continue to be used over and over, perhaps for many generations, and it suggests that they may have been used by a lineal kin group, and that everybody who is buried in the mound are related, that there is an original ancestor and a series of descendants who are buried within the mounds. Others have suggested that the size of the mound the number of burials within it, and the quality and quantity of the different grave goods that are left with as offerings may indicate the group's relative status within their own society, that those with more burials, those that are in a bigger mound, those that have more and higher quality uh, grave goods have higher status compared to those that have a smaller mound, fewer burials, less and lower quality grave goods. This is the Adena Mound that we just saw in cross-section. It was excavated in 1901. It was fully excavated, and now it no longer exists. A lot of the excavations of burial mounds occurred during the early years in the development of archaeology. 
and there's a lot of information that we would now recover in contemporary excavations that was not recovered during these early excavations. Radiocarbon dating had not been developed, knowledge of pollen and other microscopic remains in the soils that could be used to reconstruct past lifeways was not known, and so these types of samples were not collected, and a lot of information that could have been recovered has been lost forever. Archaeological excavation is inherently destructive. It destroys the site that you are excavating. It's like Humpty Dumpty. You can never put it back together. Modern excavation techniques involve sampling and leaving significant deposits behind in order to allow their reevaluation in the future with the development of new methods and techniques. So rather than excavating the whole mound, as was done in this case, modern archaeologists would excavate only a sample of the mound, leaving the vast majority of it to be explored by future generations. While many mounds have been excavated in the past and others have been destroyed by development, there are many others that remain preserved, like this one in Enon, Ohio, which is preserved in a city park. Some are preserved because later Euro-Americans put the land to similar uses. So just like prehistoric peoples came to this mound to inter their dead and to practice religious rites to connect themselves with the gods and the universe, modern Euro-Americans also come to this Methodist church to worship and also come to the adjacent cemetery which is directly associated with the mound in order to inter their dead. The early woodland or Adena burial mounds were often enclosed by an earthen berm. A ditch was excavated and the soil excavated from the ditch piled up to create this circular enclosure around the mound. And this has been suggested to be a sacred enclosure that helped enclose and contain the powers of the mound. The ditches were excavated between the berm and the mound. As you can see in this example from Kentucky, we have a low mound in the center the ditch that the trees are growing in, and then the berm surrounding it and enclosing the mound in the center. During wet periods, these ditches may collect water, which presents an interesting analogy to later historic period burial practices by Native Americans of the region. This is a early historic Shawnee Indian grave. An individual was buried in the center and then a ditch dug around intentionally to collect water during the wet season to create what was referred to as a water barrier. In several Native American myths from the eastern woodlands, there are encounters with ghosts and the ghosts are evaded and escaped by crossing a body of water, by crossing a stream, or going across a lake to an island because the ghosts cannot follow the person across water. So the logical association here would be that these water barriers contain the dead, contain the spirit of the dead, and prevent them from affecting the living. In many Native American cultures, ghosts or the spirits of the dead, those who have not made the transition from the land of the living, to the land of the dead, did not successfully make this journey and remain behind, have the potential of inf affecting the living, causing illness, causing famine and drought. And so the dead must be contained, and ceremonies and rites must be performed so the living can assist their deceased ancestors make this transition make the difficult and dangerous journey that the soul must make in order to go from the land of the living to the land of the dead. Archaeologists believe that mounds were seen as an axis mundi, and that is Latin for the world's axis. It's a point of connection between the world that we live in, the earth's surface world, the world of the living, and other dimensions dimensions below, the below realms, the underworld, dimensions above, beyond the sky, the heavens above where the stars are found. These are dimensions where great supernatural powers reside, where the gods live, where the dead go, and the souls of the ancestors can be found. 
many societies see the Axis Mundi as a world tree, and the, not a real tree, but a mythological tree that connects the world that we live on with the above realms and the below realms. And a tree is an excellent metaphor for this, for they have roots that extend down below the surface into the earth, and branches that extend above into the sky. But other cultures have other concepts of an axis mundi. They may be mountains. They may be features that are constructed by humans, like mounds or pyramids. And we will continue to see this concept of the axis mundi uh, in this following Mississippian period, and also when we look at Mesoamerica and South America. As a point of connection, Naxos Mundi allows people to contact these other realms, to interact with the gods and the dead, and gain access to the supernatural powers therein. Late woodland or Hopewell burial mounds are enclosed within very large earthworks, and usually many mounds are found within these very large earthworks. Now it may be hard to read the text, but this small square at this eastern end of the Hopewell Mounds group encloses 18 acres, whereas the larger, sort of irregular rectangular form, encloses 111 acres. An acre is equivalent to about a football field with the end zones cut off. So think of maybe a hundred football fields enclosed within this feature. The scale of the enclosure and the mounds within can be seen in relationship to the size of the more modern features on the landscape. This map was made by Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis in the 1840s. They conducted the first systematic documentation of these types of sites throughout the eastern United States. On the map you can see a road that passes through the enclosure's southern half. There are also houses on the right-hand side of the map, and the thinner lines subdividing the interior of the enclosure are the boundaries of fields. The first Euro-Americans who discovered these mounds and earthworks found it inconceivable that they could have been built by ancestors of the Native American tribes that occupied the area. These Native American groups had been decimated by infectious diseases, intertribal conflicts, and population dislocation due to encounters with the European colonists. They were much smaller in size, and the Shawnee who occupied much of the Ohio River Valley lived in small groups that moved around seasonally and did not have large monumental architecture. This lack of recognition or acknowledgement of the Native American ancestry of these features led to the creation of a mythical race of the mound builders, who were seen to be anyone but Native Americans. They were seen to be Phoenicians, or Hindus, or Celts, perhaps even Welsh or Norse, anyone but Native Americans. In the mid-1700s, Thomas Jefferson had excavated a burial mound upon his property at Monticello. In this early scientific development of archaeology, he noted the continuous occupation of the mound from prehistoric periods when only stone tools and pottery were found into the early historic period when metal goods, glass beads, and other objects that had been obtained in trade with the Euro-Americans were found and demonstrating the continuity from prehistoric into the historic period. Yet despite this early demonstration of the continuity, there still remained a large segment of the population that believed that these could not have been built by Native Americans and were built by some other peoples. In the 1880s, the newly founded Bureau of American Ethnology did a new systematic survey of these features. And Cyrus Thomas, the author, initially a mound builder proponent, came to be convinced of the evidence of the continuity from Native Americans back to the ancestral mound builders. This artist's reconstruction suggests what the site would have looked like when it was in use, 
the whole area would have been kept clear of trees and would have been open space that allowed people to gather and also allowed a clear view of the sky for it appears that some of these features may have had interactions with celestial bodies like the sun, the moon, and stars. The mounds and berms creating the enclosure are shown with a soil covering and it has been found at some sites that they used specially colored soils on certain exposures. As you pass through gates, the exterior wall of the berm may have been a reddish colored soil, but as you pass through and entered into the interior, it transitioned to a yellow colored soil. So there may have been symbolic significance in these uses of color. The well-documented mound excavations suggest that there is a standard pattern of construction of these mounds, as shown in this characterization of a cross-section from the Sipe Pricer Mound in Ohio. The area where the mound would be eventually built was first scraped down to the natural subsoil. The topsoil was removed, and then on top of this a layer of soils that had been recovered from underwater, dark muck, dark, black soils that had come from swampy, marshy areas, were la layered upon that natural subsoil. And then this dark muck would be covered with clean, water-washed sand. Upon this would be the charnel house features, shown here, the clay platform often with log crypts on top that contained bodies within them. Eventually, these charnel house features would be covered in the primary mound. This primary mound would be covered with a fabric canopy, textiles woven from indigenous fibrous plants were then layered on top of the soil, and above those fabrics, a layer of gravel would be placed. A secondary mound, often in multiple layers, would then cover this graveled surface. And into this secondary mound, later intrusive burials might be placed. Before the primary mound is sealed with the fabric canopy and gravel covering, there is often an offering placed within its summit. These offerings are usually pipes different types of pipes used in communicative efforts, the offering of prayers. In Native American cultures, smoke is often used in accompanying prayer, smoking pipes, as the smoke from the pipe carries the prayer offering upwards. The special layered construction has been suggested to be a means of reconstructing the nature of the universe, that these mounds are reconstructions of the cosmos and represent in a small condensed form the entire essence and the powers of the universe. The sand and muck layers represent the below realms, the underworld, the world that is under the earth and under water clay platforms that support log-sided crypts and contain the bodies of the ancestors, these represent the center, the earth plane. In many Native American cosmologies, the earth is a giant turtle floating in a primeval ocean, and that on top of this turtle's back, soils from below were brought by animals early in creation and piled up to create the world, and that this is a turtle island upon which we live, and that these tombs and the bodies of the ancestors within represent this center of the universe. The sky above is represented by the gravel mantle and the textiles above, because there is a land beyond the sky, and we are separated from it by the stony vault of the sky, that the world that we live in is sort of like a giant cave and that there is a stony roof above that the stars travel upon and the sun and the moon and that if you move beyond it you are in the above realms beyond the sky and this is represented by this gravel mantle and then the five pipes that are deposited at the top of the mound 
represent the smoke and communication between these different realms. Thus the mounds recreate the cosmos as a means of being able to tap into the power of the universe, and they also place the bodies of the ancestors at the center of the universe, at a point of connection and communion with the above and below realms. Most of the late woodland mounds are a lot more complex than the more simplified cross-section would suggest, rather than a single center, a single tomb or crypt at the center of the mound, there are multiples. In this map of the excavation of the site Pricer Mound, there are many of these sorts of features. Every rectangular feature, the open ones, the ones with crosses through them, those are all the graves or grave-like structures are these sorts of clay platforms that would be used to contain and hold the remains of deceased ancestors. You also see those circular ones with crosses and circulars within, circular features within them, and those are crematory basins, because often the remains are not just buried, but also cremated, and then, in many cases, cremations clust clumped together, uh, collected and commingled, and placed within the grave-like structures. The dashed lines outline where three separate charnel houses existed containing these graves and grave-like features in the crematory basins prior to their having the mound constructed on top of them, burying everything. This tripartite division is also found in many of the associated earthworks, which may have circles and squares of different configurations, three different features connected together and it's suggested to maybe represent some regional community structure, some balanced grouping of different kin groups or ethnic groups or some form of social divisions that was recognized in life and in death. The sort of life history of a mound would begin with the construction of these charnel house features and then the accumulation of graves and grave-like structures within them over a period of time as people within the community die and are added to these features. And then eventually, at some point, and we do not know what would trigger this final response, the entire collection of structures and features would be buried under the mound, and the mound would be completed and capped. Sometimes there might be additional burials within the fill later these practices indicate an extensive period of interaction with the dead. And this is also seen in early historic period Native American uh, mortuary practices in the eastern United States. For example, the Choctaw, who lived in the modern states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee, had a mortuary practice where the remains of the individuals were exposed and the flesh removed and then the collected bones bundled together and placed within a charnel house and the remains would accumulate in this charnel house as more members of the community would die over a period of time and after a certain period of time some number of years we're not sure the exact details because various records suggest different things but after a certain period of time, uh, the entire charnel house containing all of those remains would then be buried underneath a mound. The Huron, who lived in the province of Ontario in Canada, had a somewhat similar Feast of the Dead that was held in winters every three to seven years, and the bundled remains of the deceased from that interval of time were collected together and buried underneath a mound. But it wasn't just the members of the local community. Sometimes remains would be brought from other neighboring communities, sometimes people who had been born in that village but had moved elsewhere, or people who had some other special relationship with members of that community that was practicing the Feast of the Dead. And not only did other Huron from other villages participate in this, sometimes neighboring Algonquin Indians also brought their remains to be entombed collectively in these mound-like features during the Feast of the Dead. People who had been adopted ritually or had been adopted in order to establish trade relationships uh, between these different ethnic groups. And the remains 
or collectively buried together, symbolically unifying all of these people, all of the members of the community who came from different kin groups, members of different villages who were related to people within this village, and also members of neighboring kin groups who had had strong relationships with it. All are brought together in death as they had lived together in life. Here are the Sipe earthworks, which have the tripartite structure, one large, mostly circular feature with an appended circle and square. And within it, the Sipe Pricer mound, marked B, that large ovular mound in the center of the largest circle. Uh, that's where we just saw the map of the um, underlying three charnel houses and the graves that they contained. So the similarity in the three charnel houses that's found under many mounds and the three enclosures uh, within many of these earthworks may suggest some regional uh, subdivision of the community into three groups. Within these charnel houses were often several of these log crypts. You have a raised platform of clay surrounded by horizontally laid logs and on top of those are split planks uh, from other logs. The burials appear to have been interacted with over periods of time. Many of them were partially disarticulated, uh, as so decay had set in and they were moved and sometimes rearranged. It's quite possible, and the evidence seems to suggest, that over the period of time that these crypts would be in use, as the charnel house was in use prior to its entombment under the mound, that people may have been moved in and out of these crypts. Someone dies, is placed within the crypt, and then at a certain point another person later dies, and they, the earlier deceased person, is moved to another place within the charnel house in preparation of the final entombment of the entire charnel house under the mound, and the more recently deceased is laid out, arranged, interacted with, and granted offerings within the crypts. The highly stylized and fairly patterned nature of the offerings found in Hopewell burials suggests there was a standard ritual enactment as people were transitioned from the land of the living into the land of the dead. In this image, you can see the rectangular outline of where the logs containing the clay platform upon which these skeletons have been arrayed uh, formerly existed. There are two people placed within this crypt, and they have a variety of offerings. Many of them are uh, mica cutouts, uh, the hand between their heads, the large raptorial claws, the disc, the grizzly bear claw effigy, these are all pieces of mica, a very shiny, silvery object. You can also see a very large uh, marine shell up by the head as well. Mortuary rites not only allow the living to grieve the loss of their loved ones, but they also are intended to assist the passage of the loved one from the land of the living into the land of the dead, to assist their soul make what is often believed to be a fairly perilous journey. Native American mythology from the eastern United States suggests there was a fairly general concept of a land of the dead that was traveled to by the deceased, and they traveled via the path of the souls, and many descriptions of the path of the souls suggest there were various trials and tribulations that the soul had to overcome along their journey. Upon reaching the end of the Path of the Souls, they would have to pass through a portal that allowed the soul to move into the next dimension, the land of the dead, and away from the land of the living. In some Native American star lore, the Path of the Souls is seen to be the Milky Way, which forms a broad horizontal ba band of light across the night sky. If you are not within an urban area like Phoenix, you might be able to see it. The Milky Way interacts with different constellations of stars within the sky at different times of the season. And in the winter, the Milky Way is oriented north-south across the sky and comes down like an arch in the west, and it encloses the constellation Orion underneath this arch and between the horizon. 
in ancient Greek astronomy, the constellation Orion is seen to be a human. And in Native American star lore, uh, what we see is the lower half of this person, the belt of Orion, his legs, and the club that he holds beside his leg, are seen to be a hand pointing downwards with its palm out, like we see between the heads of these two individuals in this crypt. Within the palm of this hand constellation is a nebula, a faint red glowing spot, and this constellation and the nebula within it were seen to be this portal that allowed extra-dimensional travel and entry into the world of the dead. In the offerings by the head, the marine shell may be seen as some representation of the Milky Way and the path of the souls, while the cut-out mica hand is related to the hand constellation and this portal through which the deceased souls must pass in order to enter into the land of the dead. The other offerings may have been objects that were seen as necessary to assist the souls overcome the trials and tribulations that they would face along this journey on the path of the dead. So we see the raptor mica cutouts, effigy axes as mica cutouts, and also a very large obsidian knife being held in the right hand of the individual on the left hand side. Not all woodland burials were inhumations, uh, burials of the body in the flesh. Some were cremations, where the bodies were burned and the burned remains were then gathered up and deposited. Most of these were not, however, individual cremations, but they were commingled cremations. They contained the cremated remains of many individuals, not a single individual. In this case, the commingled cremations were placed within a crypt on a clay platform, enclosed by logs and likely covered by planks. The commingled cremations were of at least 50 individuals. And how do you think that we estimate the number of individuals that would be in one of these collective cremation deposits? It is based upon the weight, the weight of the entire assemblage of cremated bone compared to the average weight of a cremated human being. So we know that there were 50 or more individuals within this commingled cremation. Uh, the cremation has offerings with it, tortoise shell, copper breastplates. These were not armor, so to speak. They are sometimes found deposited on top of the breasts of inhumations, but other times they're behind the head, or at the lower back, or across the front of the pelvis. Uh, they are large sheets of copper a powerful substance that we will talk about in the next lecture about exchange. Some offerings seem to be symbolic water barriers. If you remember earlier in the lecture, we talked about how water would collect in the depressions surrounding these enclosures. And in the historic period, depressions or trenches were dug around graves in order to create this water barrier where water would collect and contain the power of the deceased, preventing their spirit from continuing to live and reside within the land of the living. And we have these symbolic water barriers created by objects that look like or are related to water, like ocean shell, which comes from water, and mica, whose silvery reflective surface looks like water. Or in these two inhumations, water barriers surrounding each body made of freshwater pearls. You can also see in the upper burial the copper breastplate is actually behind the head. In addition to the cremations and inhumations of individuals when they still had the flesh connecting all the bones, there are what are called bundled burials where the remains had been exposed decay had occurred, the bones are disarticulated, and then gathered together in a bundle. Here you can see a bundle, and it's easily to see how it was a bundle because of the horizontal arrangement of the long bones and their close, close proximity, much closer than you can get by normal flexion when there is still muscle upon the bones. 
This type of mortuary behavior was actually kind of common among Native American groups in the eastern United States at the time of uh, first Euro-American contact. Uh, it was not just the Choctaw. Uh, many other groups had exposure, decomposition, defleshing, disarticulation, and bundling of the remains uh, prior to the collective burial of the remains of all of the community's members. Many of the mounds that have been carefully excavated and well documented have been found to overlie earlier structures. And most of these appear to have been charnel houses, structures that were used for the preparation and veneration, sometimes even the storage of the remains of the deceased during rituals that would use to access other dimensions, to contact the ancestors, to assist those ancestors who may be still undergoing their journey along the path of the dead, and to contact those who have already completed that journey in order to beseech them for assistance and here in the land of the living. Assistance in curing illnesses, assistance in creating favorable conditions for agriculture and hunting and gathering, allowing plentiful rains and easy and gentle winters. In many traditional cultures, the ancestors are extremely powerful and are often continually interacted with and offerings made to them in order to assure their assistance. So what to remember? Woodland burial mounds reconstructed the nature of the cosmos and placed the remains of deceased ancestors at the center of this miniaturized universe. The structures that underlie many mounds were used to allow the living to have continued interaction with the dead. They were not placed with the, within the mounds immediately after death, rather they were placed within these structures for some unknown interval of time prior to the whole structure and all of the people who were placed within them being entombed within the mound. These woodland mortuary practices integrated dispersed households into a larger community. The small homesteads scattered across the landscape all came together and were tied together through ritual and ceremonies that were enacted at these mounds and the enclosures around them. Almost the entire community was laid to rest within burial mounds. And while some had offerings of greater quality or quantity, everyone was afforded some special treatment. And this suggests an egalitarian society where any of the differences and offerings reflect differences that those individuals had in their achieved status in their lifetime. But in general, the nature of the intermingling of the remains, putting everyone together, bringing the whole community together, particularly the commingling of cremated remains where the sense of individual identity and difference is lost, suggests egalitarian relationships within the community, high levels of equality, and very little evidence of social differentiation. <laughs>